your new friends. Plenty more of that to come. Did you enjoy the food? Yeah. I've got a nice round of applause for everybody here at the Cheltenham Tigers Rugby Club and the bar staff. They've been amazing. It's great mingling with everybody. Can't wait for France. I'm less than a week for, for many of us. So uh, exciting time. Straight into it. That first game that we talked about earlier. France, New Zealand and then into the first pool games. Wow, it's going to be amazing. So I hope you enjoyed the first questionnaire. Little Shane, what little bugger he was, the coach. <laughs> tack I remember having a phone call once. Uh, Can you come and get Shane? What's he done? Run away from a taxi in Hammerford, little bugger. Little bugger. And Jordy, great to see him. Now we've got our second Q&A now. We've got three esteemed guests. Uh, one of which you know very well, the other two you'll know. Uh, you may not have met them yet, but uh, if you get a chance to meet them, then please do. They're, they're legends of, of our game. First up, I can't see him. I'm hoping he's going to respond to his name. Former England coach and Lions coach, Mr. Dick Best is here. Oh, there's Dick. Next up, we got our very own, you heard him at the start, he's uh, obviously a stalwart of Veneto, he's uh, the most charismatic man on tour, uh, he used to drink 35 pints a night, he can't do that anymore, uh, but he's still as jovial and as informative as ever, Mr. Gareth Chilcott! The coach. And a man that really needs no introduction. Uh, in my eyes, the greatest ever rugby coach, an esteemed international himself, Scottish international, Lions international, the Lion King, the British and Irish Lions' greatest ever coach, Sir Ian McGeehan. <laughs> coach, we start with you, because you're itching to speak. Um, <laughs> Another successful night, and we, we like to do this, I mean, like a World Cup preview, get to know each other, and uh, it's already there, we're there. Yeah, I can't wait now, it's, uh, it's been a lot of organising and everything else, not me particularly, but the staff, uh, but it's, uh, it's great, and you can see now that people are beginning to bond, and people have seen each other on previous tours, and it's just, it's just on the eve of the tour, and it's going to be fantastic. I mean, I, I played in the first ever World Cup in 87. And we thought it was the biggest thing since sliced bread. But now you look at the World Cup now with the hype and, you know, the players and the fitness and the TV and the, the crowds. It's, it's going to be magnificent. I can't wait. Geech. I can call you Geech. I can call him Geech. You call him Sir Ian, but I can call him Geech. Right? <laughs> I got, we talked to Geordie about Ireland. We talked to Shane about Wales. All of a sudden, we, I spoke to you earlier, potentially the best ever Scotland team in the professional era. Rising up the world rankings and then in a bloody tough group. Yeah, it's a draw nobody wants, isn't it? Um, it it's a bit sad, I'm a bit dis I have to say I'm disappointed, but um, yeah, uh, what I'm really pleased about is how the rugby they're playing, because I think they've got a lot of followers now. Um, people are happy looking at them, watching them. I, d I am. I enjoy watching what they do and how they're doing it have occasional chats with Gregor Townsend and you know they they're all on side and you can see it and there's a chemistry there um, and the sadness is that you know we're talking about that group South Africa Scotland Ireland somebody's going to miss out and if you go through it's New Zealand or France so World Rugby have been pretty harsh it must have been all English board I think. <laughs> That, that year in the, in the in, in, in World Rugby. Dick, as a, an, an, a former England head coach, as, a, as an England rugby fan, are you worried? You know, what's your feelings on English rugby at the moment? It, arguably the most players to pick from. Uh, Eddie Jones is, um, looks like he's left England rugby in a bit of a state. Steve Borthwick's picked it up and doesn't seem to be doing any better. What can we expect? Well, I'm terrified, <laughs> to be perfectly frank. Um, we were, you know, 2019, we were in a World Cup final. And, and who, who's going to forget that game against New Zealand in the semi-final? I mean, it was our best rugby for some time. And, you know, we've gone steadily downhill. But that's what happens when you reach that sort of peak. You know, those teams need replenishing and um, we haven't really managed to do it. Eddie uh, hasn't worked his magic 
and they recognised that after a couple of years and got rid of him and they brought in Steve, who I, I have to say, and it might not be a popular thing, Steve is actually an outstanding technical coach. He's a very, very good coach. And you, you remember him from his Bath days, coach. You know, he, he was a very, very good rugby player and he understood the game. Um, but he's got a he's got a process and a system that he's put into place at the moment, which is pretty boring to watch, and it's all data driven um, and analysed to the nth degree. And he's taken some of the fun out of it. And the players now are, are not, I, in my opinion, the players are not really responding to this new um, data driven game plan. So it's it's tragic in a way, and. We've never been in this position before, going to a World Cup where you would expect England, because of the numbers and all the rest of it and the money, you would expect us to be one of the one of the favourites. And unfortunately we're not, we're slipping away. We've had a disastrous warm-up period and we're going into this uh, World Cup and there's a great deal of doubt. But I, I remember back, and I'm sorry to hog it all, but I remember back to 2007 when we were in the World Cup in France. And we lost that very first game to the South Africans 36-0. And we were actually lucky to get nil. <laughs> we, were, we were rubbish, absolute rubbish. We got pilloried by the press. The, and, the t and the squad got tighter and tighter and tighter. And they basically, the players said, right, we're going to sort this out ourselves. And they did, and they had some pretty hard-nosed people in those days. People like Mark Regan, Lawrence Delalio, Simon Shaw, Joe Worsley. There was a lot of very tough guys. And they pulled it in and they said, we basically put two fingers up to the game plan, which was constructed by one of the great coaches in, in England, Brian Ashton. They put two fingers up to it, and they went within. The group was incredibly tight. And they bullied and bulldozed and bit and spat and chewed and did everything and they dragged themselves kicking and screaming back into the World Cup and we ended up as an epic game against Australia I think in a semi-final which we weren't expected to win and we eventually got to a final we got beaten again by South Africa in the final but it just shows you what can happen with English sides when you get criticised to the nth degree and you can actually rebuild within. And I think this is what we're going to find now because these guys are playing Argentina next Saturday. And if we lose that one, and, we, and we, it's on the cards, everyone thinks it's on the cards because Argentina have beaten the All Blacks twice in the last year. Home and away. So they're a pretty decent side. So watch out. If we lose that game, we're not out of the World Cup. But we, you watch, I reckon, we'll, same thing. History will repeat itself. They'll get tighter and they'll get tighter. And they'll cut the media out. They'll cut out all the Twitter and all the bullshit that goes with it, the Instagram and the photographs. And people will stop using social media and they'll go, they'll give it hell for leather and you'll see some boys raised. Because so far, we've seen nothing of Genj, Sinclair, Itoji, these guys. They've got a point to prove, and they owe us. And I, I really hope that the media tear into them now. I want the media on their case. I'm, I'm dropping little tidbits here, there, and everywhere. <laughs> so these guys are gonna get a pile of shit next week. <laughs> And we want, them, we want them firing on all levels against Argentina. So, look, we've never been in this position before, so it's very difficult to forecast. But I know Englishmen, and I know Englishmen when the, sh when the shit hits the fan, and we'll give it a go. Can I just put my two penneth in? And it won't, take, and it won't take me two fucking hours. <laughs> For my, to my, for my worth, uh, and I think the difference between that side that lost to that South African dick is it they had a lot of good rugby brains in that side. It was prepared. They realised the tactics were wrong, and as you quite rightly said, they took it together. We will do reasonably well in this World Cup because of what Geek said. The extra draw is England have never had a better chance. As long as they can win 
two games, they're in the quarterfinal against, I, I don't want to say weak opposition, because Australia could beat us, Wales could beat us, Fiji could beat us, as they have done. But we're in with a shout for a semi-final. And I think that's when we need that big England game. So I think they will pull together. But what worries me about this England game, and certainly Steve Borthwick, who I know very well, who does, analytically-wise, he's fantastic. But he don't always see what's going on in a game. These two coaches do, or had done. You know, you've got things like it's a Leicester and Saracens sort of tend to blend. You've got players being picked who are out of form. And once you pick players who are out of form and everybody knows they're out of form, you tend to undermine selection. A toe GM had a good game for two years. Any other, any other team would have had a toe dropped to improve his game. We haven't, we stuck with him. I agree with you, Dick. He know he owes us a big game. Gen should be coming on in 60 minutes. Where he's one of the best ball runners in the game. But if he starts the game, by half hour he's knackered, he's not out of the game. You know, you've got Laws playing out of position. You've got Billy Vullapola to one game who, who has the ball eight times and makes one yard. One metre where before he used to make ground. So he's picking players who haven't actually been producing the form. You know, and he's left people like Zach Mercer out, who's been the top player in France for two years. He's picked a Saracens hooker who's had one cap as a replacement hooker when somebody like Harry Thacker is chewing up teams every week when I watch, I commentate on them every week. So my worry for England is I think we will, believe it or not, I agree with Dick, I think we will get to a semi-final. But then I think that's where our dream ends unless we can pull Sonic out. My worry is Steve have got to start picking on form and letting players have responsibility. When have we seen an old fastened three-quarter move from England? <laughs> well, I can't remember. You know, we, all we do is tend to kick. And as Geordie said earlier, kicking's a part, big part of the game. But you've got to kick intelligently. You've got to kick so you've got a chance of re-winning the ball. Or to kick it tactically. You know, as a coach, you keep looking at games, don't you? Just And, and where the game is, generally, the, the, at the top end. Part of it is selection. I don't, think, I don't think Eddie Jones picked his best team. The England team that played in the last World Cup was the youngest English team that had ever represented England in a World Cup with the fewest number of caps. They had four years in them as a group. And what Eddie Jones did was he broke that group up within a month of getting back into the UK. That was the biggest mistake I think he made. And from then, when you looked at the England selections, 9, 10, 12, 13 were never the same. How the hell do you get a chemistry to attack and play phase play and, and work forwards into a game when you've got a different 9, 10, 12, and if you could add 6, 7 and 8 as well, all different. And those are the players who dictate phase play. Those are the players who accelerate, who carry and how they work off each other. And Eddie Jones destroyed that over three years, I think. Not everybody will agree with me, no, but, no, no. but it's seeing it. And now you look at the best teams. They've all got back threes that will run the ball back. And saying, if there's any space, it's coming back. Now, we've been having some conversations earlier about, you know, if you, give it, if, if you look at France, their back three will all run it back. If you look at New Zealand... Their back three will run it back. Jordan, one of the top try scorers. If you look at South Africa, now, back three. You look at Ireland, back three, all over the place, interlinking, whatever. And then you link that with back row. And you, you start to see, the last one for me is nine. Scrum halves now have become the key players in quick ball. Not tens, nines. And you get different players running off them and how they shift it. England have kept two nines now who were brilliant players who are now a yard and a half too slow. They should have gone and they could have gone with two young 
uh, and they'll have made mistakes, but boy, would they have been around that field. So that selection, and I think it's, it's been cumulative, is watching England against Fiji, what, what frustrated me most when you're looking is I couldn't see what they were trying to do. And, and that's the bit where you say, look, the only time I saw is something which is challenging. When Marcus Smith came on at fullback and they talk about playing him, I blame at fullback. Because one thing he'll do is he'll run it, but you, you pick two others as well. But the message it gives to the rest of the England team is he's running it back. What are you going to do? Because at the moment, when you watch them, half the team are walking. Or, or they're taking five, ten seconds to get off the floor. Now, that isn't a team that can play with quick ball and play at pace and get into positions that threaten good international defences. And that's what you want, is if you're going to run the ball back or you're going to attack sides with ball in hand, all 15 players have to understand what their responsibilities are to make that work. And England don't look as though they've got players who are prepared to take responsibility at the moment with the clarity to say, yep, yeah, if we get an edge, look out, we're going to be dangerous. So it's not looking great out there, England fans, is it? <laughs> the greatest coach ever saying that. I, I go back to what Cook said. I worked with Steve Borthwick at Bristol for a couple of months. Uh, quite frankly, I can't get that time back, Cooch. You know, like, uh, uh, what a weirdo. What a fucking weirdo. Yeah. And, and, and Geach, you, you know, selection is massive. You, you were... You were Unbelievable at selection. Who could forget 97, picking Tom Smith and Paul Wallace, people saying South Africa, unbelievable selection. And I want to go to you, Dick, on Marcus Smith. I, I was present at the first Wales-England game this summer series. Marcus Smith looked the most dangerous person on the field. And I was so glad when he got taken off because he was the most dangerous person on the field, whether he's 10 or 15. If you're the England coach now, you're Steve Borthwick, what, what, what do you have to do in those pivotal positions, Dick? What, what will he be doing to try and tweak them for next week? Well, he, he, firstly, he's very fortunate and he's got Owen Farrell forward and he's got Marcus who's sort of, sort of slipped into the sort of third position now. Um, and they, they brought him on in that role of fullback and it, all of a sudden things start happening because he's an electric rugby player and he's very committed and he wants to win. I'm very fortunate because I see a lot of him at Harlequins, here, there and everywhere, and he's, he's a magic player and he lifts that side. He's special and he's, you've got to find a place for him in the side. And when it's not working, like it's clearly not been working for the last month, you've got to give this guy a run somewhere because things happen. He scores tries. He creates tries. He's special. My biggest fear about playing him at fullback is that he's sort of, he's smaller than Shane, by the way. That, that takes him doing as well. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And how he gets on in the kicking duel, because if you put Marcus Smith at fullback, anybody playing against England will just be roofing it up in the air all the time, because that is where a Stewart is good. Although he can't run, he's a bit of a cart horse, but, but you, need, you need Smith. You need Smith in that side. Yeah, but Dick, can I just add, New Zealand had two outstanding tens. And one, what did they do? Put they knew back. they had them both on the field because they could change the dynamic of the game. And you can play, come up and play at 13 and play the back three off and so on. So you had that variety of, of a decision maker, but also a, a playmaker and somebody with the, with organised defences, I, I still believe, and some will say I'm died in the wool and whatever, that if you beat the first man in rugby, you've, you've disorganised the defence. If you never challenge your players to have a go at beating the first man so that every other player in the team knows that's what you're trying to do, and you do it, different ball game. And the only example, Marcus Smith, when he ran it, that first one out, he actually, remember what happened? Clean break down the middle of the field after the next breakdown because Wales were in disarray. Second time he did it, turnover. Why? Because not one England player had reacted to him. And it's the two things that you have together. 
because that creates the dynamism that gives you the options and the variety that keep your opponents guessing. And if you've got an international top class defence against you, that's what you have to do, is keep them guessing and keep saying, first time we've got a chance, we'll have a go at the first defender. Keith, that's enough now, otherwise you'll be fucking coaching England, right? Uh, uh, we don't want that. No, we're, not, no, we're not having that. We're not having that. Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to open up to the floor in a minute, Coach, but I've, I've got to go somewhere first. Um, Brendan, who you says he's 18 games, Brendan, he was a loyal Venator traveller with us. Uh, he said, I'd like to ask this question, and it's, it's relevant to all three of you. Do you think the game has changed in a negative way from when you guys played, right? No, I'm asking, right? Uh, and, and if so, if you agree that the, the viewing of it, and I, I'm pretty sure, guys, that this World Cup is gonna, is gonna reinvent rugby. We, we always see the World Cups, but if you feel that that's the case, what would you do to change it? I, I mean, we're all talking a bit down in the dumps about England, and I agree with you first of all about Marcus Smith. He's one of our better players, and England's aren't good enough side not to have some of your best players playing. You need them on the field somehow. Um, I, you know, we're talking about England who have had a bad warm-up. That, that's not the end of it. There's lots to go. We've got some good individuals. Is whether collectively we can come together in time under this coach. That will be tested over the next two or three weeks. But I actually think we're forgetting the, the, the injuries and the politics. Some of the Six Nations have been fantastic. I love this World Cup because for the first time, we got France, Ireland, that could possibly win it. We got Scotland who could knock over one of the big boys. We got England that you've got you know you've got a game in there somewhere. And uh, fuck Wells. Um, <laughs> We're happy in the yeah, 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 yeah. No, but you know, and, and when you look in, and Geeks touched on it, you look at the Irish, the French, the Scottish, the way they run back ball, it's really good stuff to watch. You know, and you can't compare back to my era because it was all rough thunder stamping and kicking and eye gorging and all that rubbish. But can I say, the rugby today at international level generally is fantastic to watch. And I think this World Cup will be brilliant because you've got New Zealand who just love the ball in the hand. You've got South Africa who've got that power element but also fantastic wingers it's a they don't mind using you've got the sides we talked about they all play really good rugby and then you've got people like fiji samoa you know all these sides that love to play rugby you know if you take away your england cap and go okay i want my beloved england to win but if not what sort of world cup we're going to get it's going to be fantastic because the rugby today at that level it's pretty breathtaking. Yeah, it is, it is, it is. Good. But we answered that, Cooch. Uh, has anyone got any questions for our panel here? I'm sure there's some... Oh, yes, the gentleman, yeah. He's in trouble. Don't ask him. <laughs> uh, one for Ian McEachan. Ian, would you start George Horn as nine for Scotland? No. Say no to I'm getting the thumbs up. I would start Ben White. Right, right. For the same reason... We've talked about the nine, he's quick. And and he can accelerate a game. And he's a threat in his own right. And by being a threat at nine, Finn Russell, who is a natural threat, has got more time. Because if you keep the first two defenders honest with what you might do from nine, you actually give ten more time. So the, the shape of the game changes, two passes out. And I think what that's where Scotland now are so much better and I think the other part that's really fallen into place and Gregor will admit it is he and Finn are on the same wavelength chemistry forget data chemistry if players want to play for each other and understand and with their coaches they'll come out with games and support that actually creates rugby that is reactive it's it's just it's there it's responding to what's needed. And that's why I think nine has become so important. That's why I would keep right there at, um, at, Horn, at, at nine. Horn speeded up the game the last twice he came on 
in the last 25. But that may be an argument to, to keep yep. him on the bench and bring him on. Yeah, he's one of the world's best ball carriers. Yeah. He should be coming on at 60 minutes when everybody's tired and, and he makes space, in which is what your scrum half is coming on and doing. Right. For him to start at one, for England, I think it's a mistake because... You know, the Harlequins boy, Marler, is still the best scrummager in, in the Premiership. So start him, give him, let's have a base, and then bring these people on, you know, later on in the game. Well, we had a question about Scottish scrum halves, and Cooch took it to him props. <laughs> <laughs> like that. In one breath. Yeah. Great question. Thank you. We got another one. Yes, Bill. Oh, another legendary, oh, no, no, another legendary Venator traveller. Sir Bill Thomas. Thank you, Sean. Uh, guys, could I ask you, given the concern about head injuries, do you think the IRB will uh, reverse the position on tactical substitutions so that players have to play 80 minutes, so you can't have 23 stone props coming on in the second half, and therefore the collisions will be reduced in impact? Uh, forgive me, Sir William, I forgot. <laughs> forgive me. I, I was going to answer that, but but because I'm taking it over. Because I, I had when we were talking about this and replacements and everything else uh, that mentioned before about what what would you change in the game. One thing I would change is substitutes can only come on for injuries. Right. So you get players tired, and you and you get decisions then that become very different and you lose some of the impact of a fresh player and that still worries me when you see a fresh big forward come in and hitting a rock from 10 meters away you know it, it's that's the bit i don't i don't like uh, and i think already world rugby have talked about the referees looking at the aspects of the game now in how to referee that and look at what are rugby decisions, but what are dangerous decisions as well. So, and I think if you had, whether it's five or six subs, I wouldn't have any more. Um, so you've got all the positions covered, but only only cover for injuries, and and you you keep your main your main team on. That's a good point, Dick. Um, in light of what Bill said, uh, yeah, I agree with that one. Be a lot easier for a coach then as well, wouldn't it? You know, in, in terms of decisions. And, and also, just very briefly before Dick, the, the, you know, back in the day, we, we'd look at the last twenty minutes of the games, where we've worn people down, we've worn out, we've scrummaged hard for six minutes, knowing that their legs be going, so we'll give them a bit of space, and then the guskets can run round people. The troys it came later in the game when you got mistakes because people are fatigued you know is is makes it such an exciting game but also you've got that element of you know upfront power as well you can be both in that sort of situation dick elephant in the room owen farrell discuss <laughs> well he's captain and you you know he's been about for a while and you should know how to tackle when you've been playing that long and you get paid that much money um, you should have an idea, and him and his mate Vinopola, um, you know, what, what they've done is criminal in my view. Um, the professional rugby players, they train and play every day. If you can't get the tackle height down to a respectable height, you want shooting, and I just, I don't get it. I don't get why there's only one number eight. Yeah. Now, we're, now we're going into a game against Argentina, one of the best sides in the world, in my humble opinion. And we don't have a recognised number eight. We've got a convert, Earl, who's a, who's a terrific player, don't get me wrong, but he's not an eight. And we've got Mercer, we've got Dombran, we've got a whole shed load of guys back home. So Farrell, I love. Um, I know Ian loves him because he is a test match animal and he's a top, top player. And I don't think he does it deliberately. I just think... You know, he sees the mist comes down and he gets the washing line out and he hurts people. Um, but he is what he is. He's not going to change. I blame his father. <laughs> yeah. And he's Irish now, so let's all blame him. Sorry, Brendan. Any other questions before we uh, wrap this up? There must be another one somewhere. A burning... You've got one, haven't you? Yeah. yeah don't, don't check with your mate if you can ask it. You, got, you just... It wasn't actually for those guys. It was for the audience. How many points do you think Ireland are going to win by in the final? 
Well, Brent ends up with that one. <laughs> well, look, let's wrap this up with some predictions. Cooch, um, don't talk about scrummaging or Ellis Genge. Uh, who's going to win? What's the final going to be? Oh, I'd love England to be there, but uh, no, I can't see it, I'm afraid. I think semi-final might be their, their goal. Uh, I actually was looking at maybe Ireland as, as Mahar and France maybe, but that South African performance against New Zealand at Twickenham, sort of, I sort of went, fuck it, no. you know, <laughs> what, who's going to want to play them at any stage in a big game? And South Africa got all the nuts and bolts, they play the percentages well, they tackle well, they love, they love the, the DNA of arm wrestling, forward scrummaging line out, they got flair behind, they got a scrum half who quite rightly plays at pace quickly, um, they can kick in game, they can, I can't see them farther than South Africa, I hope I'm wrong. Dick, I'm going to leave the final word with Sir Ian. Dick, your prediction? I, I, I'm tempted on South Africa. Um, but I keep thinking back to uh, 2.15 in Brighton, where the Japanese run and ragged. Oh, well, we haven't thought about the Japanese, have we? No. <laughs> oh, God help us, we've got them in these. We don't mention the Japanese. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I was there that day and I couldn't believe, I mean, it was one of the great sporting upsets ever. And I watched it and I couldn't believe what I was watching and it was just fantastic. Will that happen to the Springboks again? No, I don't think so, and I concur with Cooch. Uh, I, I rather fancy South Africa. Right, okay, so two for South Africa. So Ian, it's down to you and your esteemed opinion. Who's going to do it? Well, Everybody claps or whatever he says. I can't, I can't go three now. <laughs> um, I just hope it's a Northern Hemisphere team, actually. Yeah, I just think... But apart from Wales again. For, for, <laughs> South Africa are impressive uh, because they've actually moved on and they're clever but you know we've said it before South African rugby there's a lot of intelligence in it that we underestimate the way they come through the schools the way they look at the game tactically technically they're very very good sometimes at the highest level they get overboard with the physicality I think they've got the balance right at the moment uh, but I'm going to say France. <laughs> but, well, only, only, well, because the, I don't think they'll be... The worry is playing there, they, they get over-emotional. I think they're a great side from 1 to 15. I like watching them. And... In the last year, but Ireland have done the same, which, which, and I would love, I would love Ireland to do well. I have to say, um, as well as Scotland. So, <laughs> <laughs> so what we're saying is, there's there are five, six teams in this World Cup that we would enjoy thinking that they they can move the game forward and be in those final positions. But I think it's France are able to win in different ways. And Ireland have done that as well. But South Africa, in this last game against New Zealand, where, all right, New Zealand might not have wanted to get injured because I've been in that situation with teams as well. <laughs> Scotland, the, the, the mistake is back in 1991, very quickly. Uh, last game, we weren't allowed a warm-up game in those days. You weren't allowed warm-up games. Everybody had to get to a World Cup with no experience at all of playing in the previous three months. So we persuaded the SRU Council Committee, whoever it was, which to actually say, can we have a warm-up game with the, with the Scottish players who are the group below the squad selected? And of course... What happens? That team tried to smash and maim everyone opposite to make sure that they had a chance of moving up and getting in to the World Cup squad. And strangely enough, they were called Edinburgh Borderers, so official club side. They won. 
and they're the only non-Scottish team ever to win an international. <laughs> which, which is what the president of the Edinburgh Borders team kept telling me for the next decade. Um, so the danger is there will be things that haven't come out because players don't want to get injured, they want to get to the World Cup for, and I think Jordan and Shane both mentioned that. So, first up, the big games, I think we'll see where we are. And lastly, from a Scottish perspective, I looked at the game against New Zealand. Actually, there were five really full-on scoring chances for New Zealand, which they blew, which is unheard of. So, and Scotland, tactically, are not far off that sort of shape. So they're going to have to be 100% right. But have Scotland the ability to open up South Africa? Yes, I do. I, th I genuinely think they have. And then the psychology of not giving South Africa points, which is the other bit, becomes the difficult thing. But I think, I think you said it, um, Scotland are good enough to, to create an upset. Um, which is making it a fabulous World Cup, I have to say. And most of all those big questions are going to be part of the pool stages before we even get to the knockout stages. But um, really, really looking forward. But I'm going with France. Well, I hope that's worth your appetite. From Shane Williams and John Murphy earlier. Setting that up, now we've had three legends on the stage. Please give your appreciation for Dick Best, Gareth Chilcock, and Sir Ian McGeekin. <laughs> Ladies and gents, I hope you've enjoyed this evening. Continue to mix, have another beer. We'll be mingling around. I really look forward to seeing you in France, okay? But good night, good bless for now. And ladies and gentlemen, a round of applause for Sean Holly, great MC. Thank you. Right, now we can